afternoon. I'm Sarah Fillimore. I'm a barrister at St John's Chambers in Bristol, and I practice now almost exclusively in child protection law. So I represent parents, local authorities, guardians in care proceedings. So almost all the work I do involves talking. There's very little paperwork or written advice in this field because it's primarily not one that's driven by the nuances in statute or regulatory law. So the emphasis is very much on advocacy. Not the same kind of advocacy that you'll need to be skilled in to become an expert mooter, but all of these ways of being, talking, communicating in court will come from the same root. So hopefully, although my glory days as a student debater and mooter are very far behind me now, I can remember enough about that more formalised and stylized way of competing and talking to be of some help to you. Now I'm told that I've got an hour, I'm not going to be speaking for the entire hour, so there's time at the end for questions if you've got any. But if anybody wants to ask a question in midstream, um, please feel free. This is supposed to be something interactive and helpful to you, not just an opportunity for me to admire the sound of my own voice. So if there's anything that crops up and you'd like to ask me before you forget, then please feel free. I think there may be a roving mic, but I'm not sure entirely where that's gone. Right, let's see if the clicker works. Yeah. So I was called to the bar in 1994. I then had a bit of difficulty getting a tenancy because it was bad then. I appreciate it's even worse now for aspiring barristers in England and Wales. So via the Law Commission and City University, I finally ended up at Chambers in London. And I then moved to Bristol, which was where I was born, in 2010. And that's where I've been ever since. And almost all of that time, as I've said, was spent being a family law barrister. I really, really enjoyed mooting and debating, both at school, at college, and at Lincoln's Inn. And I got quite good at it. Now, the advantages to it, as I'm sure you're here, you don't need me to tell you that, the advantages to mooting and debating for the aspiring lawyer are huge. Of course, in a way, it's sterile. A moot courtroom is not a real courtroom. The challenges you face there are not going to be replicated in a real courtroom. But it's the closest you're going to get. And it's an arena where you can really learn a lot, practice a lot, if you throw yourself in it and absorb it. Probably the best thing for me was learning that if you fail, if you mess up, it isn't a big deal, no one really cares, move on. And that's probably one of the best skills to be able to learn because it's the fear of making a mistake, of drying up, of looking incompetent, that of course, ironically, the fear will grow and the fear will ensure that you do trip up and you do fail. So mooting and debating are great arenas for building your confidence. I, I don't know where I heard this, but somebody told me that Americans, more people fear public speaking than fear death. And I think that's quite common. A lot of people find the idea of standing up and talking to an audience absolutely terrifying. Obviously, those who aspire to a career in an adversarial litigation system probably feel a whole lot less of that, or it wouldn't even be something they were drawn to in the first place. But I still think for all of us, there's, there's a primal fear of standing up, people looking at you, people listening to you, and what you say actually matters. Cases, not all, not many, but some can be won or lost on the persuasiveness of the advocate making the point. So this can be quite a heavy burden. I enjoyed doing what I did very much, and like I say, I, I used to win some nice silverware and some cash prizes, so that was also an advantage. But of course, I, and I carry on now that I'm established as a practitioner, urging every student that I meet, if you're not involved in debating and mooting, and you want to be a barrister, an adversarial litigator, you've got to ask yourself, why not? Why are you not grasping these opportunities with both hands? Because this is about your essential talent that you want to be thinking about honing and refining. I've already trespassed on this slide. The benefits of mooting to the practitioner, as I've touched upon, 
It's giving you that arena where you can practice. And of course, it isn't as good as the real thing. But just as surgeons have to build up with textbooks and cadavers and pictures and lectures, you've got to build up too to the, the real atmosphere of a live courtroom. And moots, of course, I accept, are very stylized and very formal. The kind of advocacy that I will be doing can often be quite brutal. There aren't that many nuances of law to explore. Often the cases I do are much more about raw human misery, vulnerabilities and failures than they are about the correct interpretation of an ambiguous statutory provision and so on. But as I think I said at the beginning, all these, the skills that you will need come from the same root. The branches that you can take are many and varied, but I still need the skills that I developed as a young mooter to take into those family courts. The, the proudest moment of my career, and unfortunately it's now some 20 years ago and hasn't been repeated, but at least I've had one of these examples, was I was a young baby barrister starting out and the judge looked at me and smiled and sort of laughed and said, oh, I very nearly made a decision I shouldn't have done, Miss Finnamore, thanks to your persuasive advocacy. So that was a really proud moment, which I hope one day will be repeated, but it hasn't so far. But that was really the, the key for me. Even in my field, which doesn't turn so much on the law and its interpretation, there are going to be areas which only you can usefully explore, highlight, make them sound attractive. And that's why I've got the bullet point there with advocacy and theatre. The parallels between barristers and actors are quite strong. We see it more perhaps in the flamboyant jurisdictions, say, of the United States, which no doubt, as, as England does, we always end up copying the states. In about 20 years' time, perhaps I will be striding around the courtroom and, and banging a gavel and shouting out, objection. That's not happening yet, but you can really see it in the US jurisdiction. That sense of flamboyant theatre is much more evident, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist in the more formal and staid jurisdictions, which, of course, for the moment, the jurisdiction of England and Wales remains. If you aren't in command of your instrument, which is your voice, your body, just as much as your brain, then you are not going to be able to participate in advocacy as theatre. You will be a dull person to listen to. You won't engage your audience. They will switch off. An enormous problem I have is talking too fast. Now, I think I'm adopting quite a nice modulated tone, but I've thought that before, and people have come up to me after lectures and said, oh, you were speaking really quickly and I couldn't understand what you were saying. And that's a huge failure. Because if, no matter what I'm saying, I could be coming up with the most delightfully persuasive nuggets of information. But if I'm not delivering them in a way that A, makes you want to listen to me, or B, enables you actually to listen to me, I've failed. I failed utterly and completely as an advocate. Because although the majority of cases are going to be won and lost on the black letter law, because the majority of cases it's pretty clear what's going on, at the more rarefied atmosphere of the appellant courts, where all your meeting is set, then it's a lot more ambiguous. There's a lot more up for grabs and on the table. And that is where the art of advocacy comes in. So never forget that link between advocates, acting, and theatre. You are, in a very real sense, putting on a show. So if you don't feel confident about your showmanship, when I was starting off, it was very difficult. There was no smartphones. If you wanted to record yourself, you had to go to the university video recording department and book out this enormous great tripod, which would be wheeled into a room. But now you've all got sophisticated recording devices that you carry around in your pocket, so record yourself. It's amazing what you see. A lot of people have tics, twitches, swaying about that you just don't realise and your friends are too polite to tell you about. So if you're not already in that habit, and goodness knows, I mean, technology has moved on very quickly, probably this is all now par for the course, 
But if you haven't done that or haven't done it recently, give it a go. Just start talking, standing there, record yourself and see what you see and what do you hear. Because, of course, it's notoriously difficult. The voice that I hear coming out to you, to me, sounds quite nice, quite well-paced, quite modulated. But what I'm hearing is very different to what you will hear, because obviously the way that the voice is amplified and projected. Okay, so before I look at what are the obvious core competencies for a good advocate and ergo a good mooter, you've got to take it back to basics. I think one of the things that enabled me to be such a successful student competitor was that when I was at school, I studied for the medals at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, Lambda. As a school child, you could work your way up for your certificates to do your bronze, silver and gold medals in both acting and the speaking of verse and prose. And what we did in school as we went through our certificates and medals was we learnt the basics about breathing and a phrase that has stuck with me ever since I was 12 and I heard this for the first time. Intercostal diaphragmatic breathing. It is apparently the correct way to breathe if you want to be using your voice and to try and persuade, influence or entertain people. So it's not short, shallow breaths, which ironically is what we tend to do more of when we're nervous. You know you're breathing properly and you're equipping yourself well when you can feel the lower part of your rib cage moving out as you take breaths. That's the intercostal diaphragmatic part. So we actually spent quite a lot of time simply on the mechanics of breathing being calm and being confident. And that stood me in an enormously good stead. Obviously, it's too late now to, to go back and start doing stuff at school that you didn't do, but bear it in mind. These are the absolute basics. You can be incredibly intelligent. You can know exactly what you want to say. But if you're out of breath and worried and nervous and you're speaking too quickly, if you're tripping over your shoelaces, if you're conscious that you've got egg all down your lapel, all of these things will knock on your confidence. Putting on a suit for a lawyer is the equivalent of armour for a medieval knight, the AK-47 for, for, the, for the soldier. It's about psychological preparedness. If you look smart, you will feel more confident. So don't ever be blasé or dismissive of these very basic points. You've got to practice deep breathing, make sure you've got enough air to support your voice, and make sure you are looking smart and ready. Now, it should go without saying, know and apply the rules for your particular competition. I can't pretend to talk about what mooting is like for you now. I don't know, the, I don't suppose the rules have changed over much. We're still doing it in formal teams of two, a senior and junior, app junior appellants and respondents, and so forth. But different competitions, certainly when I was involved on the debating circuit and mooting circuit, some had quite particular rules about the number, for example, of authorities you're allowed to cite and the way in which you must cite them. Some competitions had rules about how you presented any paper information you want to give to the judges. I would imagine now it's very different from me than it was back in the early 90s because you have got access now to so much more technology, ease of word processing, ease of dissemination. So something basic like that, don't trip up simply because you've missed a short and simple rule because one of the key things is clearly going to be your attention to detail. So all of these things you will be judged upon. So that's the easy stuff. I mean, and anyone can do that with half a brain cell. You can 
take some deep breaths, dress smart, and make sure you know what you're doing. What are the rules? Who are you actually representing? Probably every barrister you speak to will have a horror story about the time they went to court thinking they were representing the respondent and they were actually representing the appellant. This happens far too often, really, for me to feel comfortable about it. And a big mistake made at the outset that isn't corrected will clearly have enormous ramifications down the line. But moving really into the meat of what I wanted to talk about, because this is where it gets more difficult. This is a lovely quotation from John Davis, who was the 14th United States Solicitor General from 1913 to 1918. And he's spot on. The key to advocacy is focus. The advocate is angling, consciously and deliberately angling for the judicial mind. And it's such a good quote, because often I, I read guides to mooting people to say, well, should I write a script? Should I write it all out? I say, well, if it helps to write yourself a script and practice it, then do that. But anyone who tries to moot from a script is going to fail, because it isn't a poetry competition. You're not delivering a speech. As we go through the core competencies, hopefully you'll see that. But the job of the advocate, advocate is to persuade the judge, to bring the judge round to your way of thinking. So that means going in with a script would be a bit like just trying to fish with a massive great net, paying no attention to where the fish was, what it was doing, whether there was a hole in your net. You just keep trying with the same equipment and you're likely to fail. So if there's only one thing that you take away from this, then I think that quote is probably the best thing. You are angling for the judicial mind. It's the judge who's going to make the decisions. So you may feel you've done a brilliant job, but if you don't persuade the judge around to your way of thinking, in essence, as an advocate, you've failed. I mean, there's loads of amazing quotes and th which are very humorous. My favourite, I think it was Marshall Hall, who's delivering some amazing oration. And the judge says, well, that's all very well, Mr Hall, but I'm none the wiser. And quick as a flash, he says, perhaps not, my lord, but you are certainly better informed. So that's all fun. And he must have come out of court feeling very proud of himself. But I can't, I'm pretty sure that he wouldn't have won with that particular judge. But that's the kind of quickness and thinking on your feet you're going to need. As long as you don't lose sight of your essential goal, it's to persuade the judge, not to show off your own rhetorical flourishes of brilliance, tempting though that may be. So this is then the meat of it. What do I think are the core competencies? What makes a good mooter? Let's take them in turn. Organisation, it sounds incredibly dull, and it is, but it's what we've just been talking about. If you are not organised, then expect not to do very well, unless you're incredibly lucky and very good at thinking on your feet. But given that in a moot, you know you are in a very formal and stylized competitive arena, there's going to be much less opportunity for you to shine in that more haphazard and flamboyant way. Most, if not all, competitions will judge you, at least in part, on the organization of your material. Not merely the way you present it when you're on your feet, but the way you present it before anything's even started. Back in my day, it was lever arch files with little sticky notes and highlights, and we all practiced getting the citation of the cases right. If it please your lordship, could I refer you now to paragraph five? Is your lordship familiar with the facts of the case? All those, all those phrases that show you are prepared, you are competent, you are organized. The judge can then relax and listen to what you have to say. Not only have I participated in moots, I've also judged quite a few. And it is very nerve wracking for the judge when the mooter in front of you is panicking and flustered and drops their file and all the sticky tabs have gone out. They haven't highlighted the quotes they want. Everything gets off onto the back foot. And as a judge, you feel, you feel for the speaker, but you also feel quite nervous about where is this going? What, what am I going to be hearing? So that's, again, something that's well within everybody's capabilities to sort out. Practice, be organised, know what material you want to refer to, know where it is in your selection of authorities and make sure the judge, if you're using a bundle, has the bundle. This is a mistake I still make today and I'll be gallivanting off and the judge will say, 
well, excuse me, Miss Finnell, but I, I haven't seen the case summary of which you speak. And again, I'm always so excited to get started, I don't check the absolute basics. Does the judge have in front of them, in whatever form, be it electronic or paper, the documents to which you're going to be referring him or her? Knowledge. Again, it goes without saying, but I'm saying it because a lot of competitions will have that down as the heading on which they're going to give you the marks out of 10 or whatever. You've clearly got to know the law you're attempting to apply. Now, from my recollection in moots, I thought they were actually quite unfair because very often there would be a really tough point for the appellants and some really easy points for the respondent, which always used to make me cross because I don't think that's fair. I don't know now if more efforts have been made because there must be loads of examples of really ambiguous appeal points. If you do find that you're on the losing end, I think that is the short straw. But again, both appellants and respondents need to have a very thorough grasp and understanding of A, the problem in front of them, and B, the authorities upon which they rely. Again, that sounds obvious, but when I've been judging, quite often I'll see students who are, maybe it is nerves, but they'll start launching into description of a case and I'll say, but, but I, don't, I don't know that authority. Could, could you help me, please, just, just with a brief precy of the relevant facts? And they can't do it. So I don't know whether its nerves has wiped all that out from their brain or that just wasn't in their brain to begin with. But the two things obviously bleed into one another. If you've researched, if you've practised, if you've read, then you'll be more confident and less likely for fear to overwhelm you. Clarity is often a standalone category for the judges because, of course, it doesn't matter how organised or knowledgeable you are if you're not clear. People who are not clear can be very frustrating to listen to because you don't know where their sentences are going. You're wasting valuable processing energy trying to work out what it is they want you to understand. So the best advocates, in my view, are advocates who are crisp, who are clear, who speak in short sentences. The longer and more convoluted your sentence structure, the more it indicates, I think, to the listener that you're on the hoof. You're making this up as you go along. And obviously, sometimes as an advocate, you will have to do that. But in this more formal and stylized arena, you are more subject to a framework and you'll be working within that. So a lot of this you will be able to practice. It is very important to be clear. It's the usual joke that someone will start their submissions by saying, my Lord, I have three points to make. And then the joke is how many points we can actually catch them making. And I think my best was eight. So something went wrong there. There was a lovely attempt at putting a structure on the speech, but it didn't quite pan out. But if you are able to do that, th there are three points which I would like to make before your Lordship. The first point is this, the second point is this, the third point is this, and in conclusion, that's a lovely, clear, and sensible structure. But again, you can be as organised, as knowledgeable, and as clear as you like. If you're not persuasive, then you failed. Now, persuasiveness is an art, and it's not a science. In a way, it's rather <coughs> futile for me to be here trying to lecture you about persuasiveness, because there's no point in you trying to adopt a style that works for me that doesn't work for you. A lot of this comes with practice. In the real world, a lot of this will come with knowing your tribunal, knowing the particular personality of your judge. There are some judges who I would never attempt to persuade in a certain way. There are other judges when only that will work. So again, the best advocate, even though sometimes it sticks in the craw if you're dealing with a judge you think is being particularly belligerent or, un or unpleasant, the best advocate will adopt their strategy, their manner of speaking, their language to the tribunal. Now that's obviously a mooting, you don't have that advantage, you may if you're being judged by senior members of the judiciary or members of your own faculty, you may know people, but it's not uh, similar to that example. You've actually got an idea of their judging <coughs> style. So mooting is going to be a lot more formal. So if in doubt, adopt a very formal approach. But still remember that you're going to need to try and be persuasive. If your arguments are awful, 
then you need to make your structure as clear as you can and you need to be as interesting as you can. So just something simple like modulating your tone of voice, just pausing, take a breath. Sometimes you could speak a bit more quickly. These are all things perhaps you could look at if you do record yourselves and have a listen and think, how could I actually make this experience a bit more entertaining for my listener? And very often all you need to do is just think about modulating your tone of voice and pausing, just simple things like that, which I know are more difficult to do when you're a bit stressed and nervous. Now, responsiveness is a real key one. And that goes back to what I was saying about the issue of a script. The more you're wedded to the script, the less responsive you're going to be able to be. Now, there's a variety of questions that a judge will throw at you, both in a moot and both in a real live court scenario. And these responses can vary from, first of all, that the genuine inquiry for assistance. The judge is actually interested in what you're saying, but it's a bit of a novel point, doesn't quite sit with that authority. So in the spirit of keenly wishing to understand, the judge will pose a question. But, well, could you help me here, please, Mr. or, or Ms. I, how does that relate to the decision of... And that's, that's a great question to have, because if you know your stuff, you can answer fluidly, fluently, immediately. The judge is already on side because they're interested, they're asking questions, and you can improve that. However, that's only one type of question, and sadly, in mooting and in real life, is probably the rarest type. A lot of questions you will get um, will be more deliberately hostile. Because this is a way, isn't it? The best way to test you. And judges in the real world do this just as much as judges in a competition. But judges in a competition at least are motivated by more benign motivations than some of the real judges you'll find if you play this trick. So you've got to be ready. You've got to be ready for the question that is clearly one that is showing the judge's irritation or annoyance with your argument. It isn't a genuine inquiry at all. It's along the lines of, well, well, how could you be so foolish to attempt to argue this nonsense in front of me, to put in a more polite way? Those people who have got a script will be completely thrown by this, because, of course, there isn't anything on their script telling them where they need to go. Of all the things that I've witnessed judging moots, I think I've said another one was the most painful, but scrap that. This is the most painful. The most painful thing to have to watch is somebody flailing on the end of that kind of barbed and hostile question. Because it's almost like a bit like a feeding frenzy. The judge will sense weakness. There's blood in the water. And the nasty judges in moots and in real life will go in with another question because they can see that you're weak and they'll go in for the kill. So it, it's a horrible thing to experience, and I'm afraid in real life there are some judges that we all know um, and love who do like to test young advocates in this way. It's almost a bit of a blood sport for some. So I was able to cope admirably well because of my mooting experiences, and perhaps this can be my second most proudest moment at the bar when I was at Milton Keynes in front of a judge who shall remain nameless, um, who was so angry and cross with me in the points I was making for, for some reason or another, that he told me he was going to throw out my case and not make a decision on it. And what did I think about that? I was not phased. I was not alarmed because the years of my rigorous mooting training kicked in and I simply replied calmly, well, Your Honour, I'm afraid there will be a trip to the Court of Appeal in our future <laughs> because this case involves two children aged four and six and this court must make a decision about their future. He calmed down. We all went and had lunch. And when, it, when I came back, it was clear that I had passed some kind of test because the judge was now full of smiles. Now, I'm afraid there are some people in a professional capacity who seem to be so bored with their everyday job that... This is what they'll do for fun. I stress they are a minority, but they exist. And sometimes in some mooting competitions, this may be a deliberate strategy. The judge may think, oh, my God, you're, you're, this, this, this candidate is too slick. They've got a lovely bundle. They're very confident. They clearly know the law inside out. Right, what can I do to try and shake them? What can I do 
to try and test these core competencies because I can't let this person just, just win the competition without a bit of probing. So always be ready for that. Now clearly, if judges are simply being ignorant and rude, which is very rare, it's very easy to deal with. You're just very polite back. But if judges are probing a flaw in your argument, then that's something that's going to be more difficult. Hopefully, you won't ever be in a position where you're presenting an argument so bad that you're going to set up judicial anger from the very beginning. But you've got to be realistic about what you're doing. If you know certain points you've got a week, well, you need to think about why you're making them in the first place. But of course, I do remember from my meeting days, sometimes it seemed that we had a very short straw on the arguments that we had to present, and we had a very little in our legal arguments that was winning. So instead, we decided to ramp up the persuasiveness, the clarity, and the responsiveness. And our team would often win because we were trying to demonstrate and develop all of those core competencies. So that brings me to the end of my PowerPoint. Probably, sorry, slightly quicker than I had time, but that's because I speak very quickly, and I've probably been guilty of that right here and right now. I understand there's a roving mic, so if anybody wants to ask any questions, then please feel free, because I think I've certainly got, you've got a, at least another 20 minutes of my time. Or if not, oh, here's a question at the front here. Mm, no, most definitely. I mean, there are so many books, discussions, articles that you can read. I mean, this is an ancient science because obviously we, we are in a world where we didn't have word processing smartphones or even easy access to paper. The, the power of the storyteller. I mean, this has been key to human civilizations for thousands of years. So it's a shame in a way that we forget the wisdom and the teaching, certainly of the, of the ancient Greeks and Romans. So it's well worth going back and seeing what was recommended as, as powerful then. The tragedy is, however, for most of those of us who go on to become lawyers, is we never ever get the chance to deploy those skills because it is only in the appellate courts that you're going to get the opportunity to demonstrate those skills in front of a tribunal who actually wants to listen. And it's one of the saddest things, I think, for many law students. You go and you study law and you study the decisions of the Supreme Court, law at its highest level. You come out and you practice and you'll never meet one of those cases again. You'll have judges who are in a bad mood, who are grumpy, who've got a huge slew of cases. But then again, that's where persuasiveness and responsiveness come in. You've got to be responsive to your tribunal. And that's perhaps I should have made that point about meeting. This is one of the loveliest things about meeting. It will give you the opportunity to practice that kind of more rarefied advocacy, which you may not get the opportunity to do when you're actually in the real world. There's not that many positions to be filled in those cases involving human rights, for example, which really bring together all those necessary skills of advocacy, because that's really where the, the, the rubber hits the road, isn't it? That's where you as an advocate can make a difference. So hopefully all of you in this room are destined to go on to hit those rarefied heights. But if you're not, or your career takes another turn, then meeting is a very enjoyable opportunity to actually follow in a little way in the footsteps of the great advocates like Marshall Hall. So again, that's something that's also worth studying. And, and again, that shows really the point I'm making is how that has sadly fallen out of fashion. I don't think that there will be advocates remembered in the same way because we just aren't given the opportunity that there used to be to perform as much. So yes, I, th I think that's kind, of, that's kind of bittersweet that you remind me of that, but certainly it's, it's very worth studying. <laughs> Hello.
back pocket about how to deal with that? <laughs> do you do you lay chaff and avoid? Well, do you try and change the subject? Oh look, there's a bird. I mean, how? Well, how do you how do you, do you well, have three or four things which you right. do when you've been caught okay. out? Well, this this is why I, I deliberately held back from personal examples because they are of limited use. Because what works for me is not going to work for you. I'll give you an example of my go-to strategy, which I call disarming candor. Now, the, my one and only appearance in the Court of Appeal was for an absolutely hopeless case involving someone who had been a litigant in person. She made an application to appeal. The judge thought, oh, litigant in person, immediately gave her permission to appeal in front of a three-man Court of Appeal. Now, normally, that only happens when you've got a decent case. This was a hopeless case. For reasons I don't understand, I ended up instructed and attended court which you can imagine um, was quite a fun experience. I had, for example, forgotten that in the Court of Appeal you are required to be robed and wigged. I didn't have my robe or my wig because I don't go to the Court of Appeal. So I failed at the very beginning. I wasn't wearing my smartest suit. I was in a borrowed wig and gown. My opponent breezed into court, um, greeting everybody by name, indicating, of course, that he was in the Court of Appeal every day and who was I. And the questions began to come. And I'll always remember one question. It was, well, but Miss Fillimore, what, what on earth would the Portuguese authorities make of all of this? And my response was, well, I'm afraid, my lord, I am entirely ignorant of the reaction of the Portuguese authorities to my submission. And I was quite lucky because they laughed. They thought I was quite funny. <laughs> but this is the Court of Appeal. They were relaxed. The cases they do are interesting. If I tried disarming candor on an angry district judge, there might be a whole different outcome. But if your point is weak, I think that the best strategy is you've got to, if you can, confess and avoid. You've got to acknowledge what the judge is saying. I appreciate that that point um, is not, your lordship is not currently finding that point persuasive. May I go on to deal with it in this way? May I ask you to look at the arguments on that issue, which may bolster it? May I ask you to detract from the arguments which attack my argument? I, it's really difficult. I think you've got to find a style that works for you. But at the end of the day, it's confidence and it's focus. You need to reassure the judge they're in safe hands. If you start trembling and blushing and crying, all of which I have seen, and not in a moot courtroom either, in a, in a real courtroom. Immediately, the judge doesn't see you as a worthy adversary or an equal. The judge will see you as prey, and you will not be somebody who's able to bring the court around. You won't be able to be persuasive if you're frightened. And that's perhaps the key thing with mooting. It allows you to make those mistakes on a stage, which isn't the real world, and give you the confidence. Because I, I think the judges in the Court of Appeal must have found that a fairly unusual response. And that's why it took them by surprise, and they all chuckled. It didn't help me, of course. The Portuguese authorities would have trashed my point in five minutes, and I knew that. But I tried to give them a bit of showmanship, and they chuckled and they enjoyed it. I didn't win my case, but I never was going to win my case because I knew at the outset it was hopeless. And that's sometimes, I think, things that judges don't really understand. And this won't be an issue in a moot court because you won't have your client sitting behind you. But in cases such as crime and family, your client wants you to make a fight for them. And sometimes that does mean making duff points. And in the real world, we've got lots of code phrases so the judge knows where you're coming from. You can say, I am instructed to make the following point, which is quite simply awful, but I'm instructed to make it. So they will know, they will know that's that code. You won't have those sorts of pressures in an appellate court or a moot competition. But sometimes the advocacy that you're doing is not just for the judges. I just thought I'll throw that point in there. Sometimes you have to remember you have a client sitting behind you who does want to know that you've understood the points and you're going to put up a bit of a fight. And you can never assume either a point is hopeless. I mean, you've got to be realistic and exercise judgment. But perhaps just one more personal example. I had a case involving a baby with broken bones. My client's case was the dog done it. The difficulty with this case was that none of the medical experts agreed with me. But I managed to get one of the medical experts to say it was just about theoretically possible 
that a dog jumping on the child in the manner described could have fractured the collarbone. She asked about within the areas of, of possibility. However, the judge wanted to know in my closing submissions why didn't the child cry out then, Miss Fillimore, because all the medical experts say the child would have cried out. But luckily for me, I'd prepared my closing submissions well and I was immediately able to fire back with those authorities that reminded the court when you're dealing with medical expertise, the court must always factor into its deliberations the consideration that we don't know everything, that medical knowledge is evolving and expanding. Now, that was a very interesting case for me because I could see that up until that particular exchange, the judge was going to make a finding that my client had broken her child's collarbone. After we had that exchange, he changed his mind and said he could not make a finding that the local authority had not shifted the burden of proof. So that was quite an interesting example for me because I went into that case assuming it was game over. I had no medical experts on my side, but it showed to me that the benefits of being prepared, being clear and being persuasive because you could actually see in the judge's face that he was changing his mind. And that is quite a wonderful moment. And again, I stress that's only happened to me a handful of times in my career. But that's why you, know, you train as an advocate, because that, that's the impact that you're hoping to have. Sorry, Richard, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> but you've got to find what you're comfortable doing. As long as whatever you do, you do with style and panache, you should be OK. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to ask, following really on the point that you've just made, how would you advise students to deal with nerves? Because I find that sometimes students, they have such a great argument, great memorials, they're well prepared, and then they just freak out and panic. It, it's difficult because a lot, of, a lot of this is innate. It's your personality. And I was one of those annoying little children. Everyone said, oh, you're going to be a barrister, aren't you, because you won't stop arguing. So... <laughs> Which is true. So I was born that way. It doesn't mean that I couldn't refine and hone my skills. But there are some people who are going to start off at a disadvantage. They are going to be more nervous. That's just the way they're built. So I'm not sure if your innate personality can ever be changed. You are who you are. But we can all become the best version of ourselves that we can be. I needed to tone the dial down on my abrasiveness. Some people need to turn the dial up on their confidence. That's why meeting's good, because it will give you, in your head, positive experiences. I coped with being asked a difficult question. I did not vomit, faint, or cry. I did it. And that's how I think you build up those parts of your personality which might inherently need strengthening. Now, there are still barristers who tell me that they, they throw up before cases. And it's actually seen as a bit of a positive because a bit of a n some nerves give you gives you that bit of a zing. I'm not I'm not so sure about that. Um, <laughs> if but again, if that works for you, if that's one of the ways that you can cope with a personality that is less geared towards showmanship, is by being sick before you go into court. Well, it, it's a bit extreme. But if that works for you, but again, you've got to I just think be sensible. You know who you are. You know your style. If you're not going to be fond of big, flamboyant, rhetorical gestures, then don't try and make them. You'll make yourself miserable, and it won't be comfortable for people listening. But quiet, calm competence is also very effective and a good style. So you need to identify what you can do well, and you need to make sure you don't trip yourself up, as I did, stupidly, by not even having the right uniform for the Court of Appeal. So you can imagine how how much on the back foot you're starting off then because you don't have the right equipment with you. And that was stupid, and that was something that I could have avoided. So it is tricky, but I, I, I used to think that I, I didn't think people would change, but I tracked some student debaters when I we had debating classes at City University, so I was able to track them for almost two years, and I could see a definite improvement in those students who started out really timid and nervous and by the end of the two years, they were enjoying the process. So I had to change my opinion. I think a lot of it can be learnt. Confidence can be assumed. 
which is what I assume the barristers were throwing up before court are doing. They're putting on a mask. And just by standing straight, breathing in, shoulders down, you start to feel more confident. So it's just tricks like that. I think prepare your body, prepare your mind, know what you're doing, but don't try and fight against your essential nature. I mean, there are some barristers who are quite effective, and I've seen them roaring up and down and swaggering and shouting. And, OK, that seems to work for them, but it's not a style I could happily adopt. And, and you don't need to. There are lots of different styles, and all will be effective to varying degrees in different environments. The mooting style is probably going to be pretty much, though, your very straight formal, if it please your lordship, if I could um, draw your attention and being very polite. But obviously, once out in the real world, you might have to cut your cloth a bit more dif differently. Well, again, uh, what I've just, I think, just been saying, it's about practice, isn't it? If For a lot of people, it's innate, and they have a gift. For the majority of people, though, they will think of the clever thing to say the next day. That's a very common. So it doesn't hurt maybe to have some stalling sentences. I'm just trying to think what, what I say if, that, if I get really flawed. I think my go-to is always disarming candor, and I say, oh, I can't answer that, my lord. You've, you've identified one of the weaknesses of my argument. But if I could draw your attention to this point, and I think that's exactly what I did with the, the broken collarbone case. My case was very weak on the expert evidence, but luckily for me, I had a comeback because the judges are deliberately told that they cannot base their decision just solely on expert evidence because it's, it can't ever be definitive. So it's knowing your case, trying to pinpoint the weaknesses in advance. But if you're really in a hole, I do think it's just confidence, because if you can make the judge smile or appreciate your bravery, then I think they are happy to listen to you. They think, this is a safe pair of hands. This is somebody I can trust. This is not somebody who is frightened. Because fear in somebody else, I think, sets off a very unfortunate reaction in the person who's having to watch it. We all start to feel quite anxious ourselves. And judges are, of course, only human. So, and very often a human response is to mirror the interactions. So I suppose it, I don't think it really matters what you do say, as long as you say it with confidence. And if you have got a better point, start trying to steer the judge to that better point. But if your point is absolutely hopeless and the judge tells you he thinks it is, my advice is you don't try and argue with that judge, at least not for very long. Because one of the worst things to be told by a judge is sit down. Now that's only happened to me twice. But that, I don't think that ever happens in a moot. I hope it wouldn't. <laughs> but again, but that's back to what we've been talking about, responsiveness and persuasiveness. If the judge is really not with you, give it a go, but then move on. But it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's that you've got the case that you've got. You've got to try and present it in the best way that you can. But my bitterest memories of mooting competitions is when I always seem to be having the absolute worst arguments to make. And I thought, this is really unfair. But I still managed to win some of the moots, so... It's hard to, it's difficult to foresee the amount of time you might spend answering questions. Um, how would you, or how would you advise mooters to deal with being told to summarize their argument in about 45 seconds after spending maybe 15 minutes answering questions? You've got to be able to do it. I mean, <laughs> I think, w was it Einstein who said, if you can't explain it simply, you didn't understand it. If you can't summarise your points in 45 seconds, then I am actually a little worried about the strength of those points and the depth of your understanding because you, you are not, you're going to have to throw the script away. And, and judges will be aware of that. If you didn't get time to develop your arguments because you were answering questions, well, you're not going to be marked down for that. In fact, you will be marked up, I would have thought, for your responsiveness. So, and, and I know it's, it's annoying because when you've, you've practiced and you know you've got some really wonderful points and you want to make them in a wonderful way and the judge isn't interested, you're, yeah, no, never mind that. What about this? Because that's why, you know, judges are paid to be judges. They will hone in 
on what for them is the question they want to be answered. They don't care about how long you've taken crafting a wonderful speech. I soon had that knocked out of me in practice. Because obviously the level of courts I work in, nobody cares. Just, just get on with it. What's, this is the issue. What do you have to say about that? So again, it goes back to don't have a script. Or if you do have a script, be prepared to abandon it. And make sure if you were asked, well, no, I, I, just, I just want your, your three best points. I mean, the, another brilliant John Davis quote was apparently, he said, I have three arguments. One is unanswerable. One is dreadful, and one is really great. He said it a lot more eloquently than that. And, and the judge said, well, well, can you just give me your best argument, Mr. Davis? I said, well, I'm not going to tell you which of it it is. <laughs> so that's, that's an example of a very confident advocate. And obviously, I think he was before the United States Supreme Court. So that was a tribunal that probably was a bit relaxed about that. That wouldn't work at a lower level. But you've got, I think you've just got to be able to do it. But it is... For many of us, it's one of the most difficult things to do to throw the script away because we've spent time on it and it makes us feel comfortable and we want to say it now that we've actually gone through all that trouble of thinking about it. But be prepared, I think, write the script, practice it, then rip the script up and just be ready for anything. I mean, scripts can be good as long as you're not wedded to them. People fall down massively and I, I've seen them sort of almost batting the judge away, desperate to get back to point three on the bullet points in front of them. And the judge has just said, I'm not interested in point three. I want you to tell me about point five. And of course, that, that is it. you get marked down for that quite obviously because you are certainly not angling there for the judicial mind. You're effectively ignoring the tribunal. So that won't work in a moot and it won't work in a real court. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just have a question um, about, uh, with this being an international competition, if you have any advice for students facing the prospect of arguing before judges who might come from different cultural or educational backgrounds than uh, those of uh, where the students come from? Are there certain tactics or techniques that you feel uh, supersede or are insulated um, more so than others uh, with respect to uh, cultural backgrounds, educational backgrounds, uh, that sort of thing? Well, I think I've, I've alluded to some in the speech. Clearly, the United States has, has a very common jurisdiction with England because the bulk of the common law that will apply here has also been taken up. So it's not that we're different in terms of law, but in terms of presentation in the courtroom and the more flamboyant advocacy styles, it's much more law as theatre. I don't think that would go down well so much here, but it's about knowing your tribunal, knowing where you're at. I think most places where English is a primary language will share the common law basis. So you're going to be okay on that. We, we've got a lot of the same basic principles. Obviously, the laws all start diverging, but you have the same root. It's an interesting question because I've never, I've debated internationally, but never mooted internationally. But I have to say, what made a good debater crossed countries and cultures. It, it's all about showmanship, clarity, responsiveness, persuasiveness, and those must be core competencies that exist across every jurisdiction, I would have thought. Um, and I certainly don't think that you would be penalised in any competition for behaving in a way that was not sort of culturally appropriate, because I'm, I'm not sure what that could possibly be. If you're being a good mooter in one jurisdiction, you'll be a good mooter in another, because you'll know the law, you'll be polite, you'll be organised, you'll be clear, you'll be persuasive. But again, it, perhaps going back to the very first point I made, know the rules of your particular competition. I don't think rules can prescribe cultural awareness, but they will tell you, this is what we'll expect, this is the time you've got, that's very important, this is, these are the authorities, this is the way you can cite them. So sorry, that's probably not very helpful. But again, it's, it's a wonderful experience to go to different countries, different legal systems, and to see how people cope. Well, if that is an end to the questions, and that's probably quite nicely taken us up to the end of the hour. So thank you very much for listening and enjoy.